Hey folks, welcome to Apex Hours. My name is Mitch Spano. I'm super excited to have you here today. Today we're going to be kicking off a little design pattern series about object-oriented design patterns and their usage within the Apex programming language for your applications built on Salesforce.com. All right, a little bit about me. My name is Mitch Spano. I'm a 16 times Salesforce certified uh, application engineer at Google. I've been in the Salesforce ecosystem since 2013. You can find me at on Twitter at Mitch Spano, or you can check out my personal website, www.mitchspano.com for some more Salesforce engineering content. All right, for this series, what are we gonna be focusing on? We're gonna be focusing on uh, object-oriented design patterns. So that means we're gonna start off with some of the foundational topics about object-oriented programming. So we're going to rediscover the fundamentals. We'll make sure that we're all on the same page as far as vocabulary goes. And then we'll uh, uh, explain a little bit about what some of the tools are that we have within our tool belt to help us create really, really elegant solutions. Um, once we're done with kind of our overview of the object-oriented programming basics, we'll take a look at some individual design patterns. So we'll talk about when they should be, when they should be used, what problems they solve, uh, and we'll give a deep dive into each one of their technical implementations with uh, providing some real world examples that you can use within your Apex code today. Uh, so fundamentals of object oriented programming. Let's get started with a refresher on all of the things that we what may have learned in computer science class. Maybe we've forgotten or maybe we've never been exposed to them before. All right, when it comes down to it, there are three main features of object-oriented programming. Uh, these are the differentiating factors that would separate object-oriented programming from functional programming or other programming paradigms. And these are the three that we care about. Uh, inheritance. So inheritance allows us to create a class which is built upon the functionality of an existing class. So we can greatly reduce our, uh, our overall number of lines of code that we need to write. Polymorphism uh, means many forms, and it means that we can use a single symbol or a single method name across multiple separate types. Um, and then encapsulation. So encapsulation uh, allows us to restrict access to some of the data that we hold within our objects components within runtime. So uh, all of these three things together enable us to create what we call object-oriented programming uh, which really is a powerful paradigm. All right, so one of the things that we do within object-oriented programming is we use class diagrams. And these are these table-like structures that will communicate the classes, classes structure without necessarily needing to write any code. Uh, and here we've got a little bit of a legend or vocabulary that we can refer back to when taking a look at future class diagrams. So the class diagram here has a few, few key features. So at the very top, it'll always have the name of the class that we're trying to describe. That's followed by a section which, which enumerates the variables that are part of the class that we're trying to describe. And then there's another section below which enumerates the methods that are part of the class that we're trying to describe. And we use a little bit of this, uh, this notation here before we define either a variable or a method with this dash, the hash symbol, or the plus. So this minus or dash means that the variable or method that we're trying to describe is private. The hash symbol means that it's protected, and then the, the plus symbol means that it is public. So this, uh, this applies to variables as well as to methods. So we have private, protected, and public methods as well. Um, and then another thing that we'll, that we'll use when we're talking about class diagrams is that the underline means that a variable or a method is marked as static. Okay, so we're going to start off with one of the most foundational or important uh, concepts within object-oriented programming, and that is inheritance. So when we use inheritance, we want to create classes that are built upon existing classes, so that way we can reduce the number of lines of code that we actually need to write to define how our program should behave. So for example, here we have the existing bicycle class. And what we've, def we've done is we've already defined that the bicycle can speed up and can slow down. We've already defined how it does that, right? Now, what we do is we create a child class or an extension class called mountain bike. 
we say that this might be the parent or superclass, and this might be the child or subclass. And we say that the mountain bike class extends bicycle. And when it does that, it inherits all of the methods and properties of the parent bicycle class. So when we define a mountain bike, we don't necessarily need to redefine what speed up and slow down mean because that we get those for free by inheriting them from the parent or super bicycle class. Next is polymorphism. So this enables us to use a single symbol across multiple different types. So here we could have the string class and we can add two strings together using the add method. Or we could have the integer class where we can add two integers together using the add method. So polymorphism is what enables the programming language to understand that add on a string is different than add on an integer, but we can reuse that add verb or method name uh, across multiple different types and give them each a meaning that is specific to the data type that we're trying to represent. And finally, we have encapsulation. So encapsulation is used so that way we can restrict access to some of an object's components from the outside world. So in this particular example, we've got the person class. It's got two private variables, instance variables called first name and last name, but it's got a public method called get full name, which would return to you a string. So in this scenario, the only thing that we know is that the person has a full name. We don't necessarily have the ability to modify the first name or the last name, but somebody, uh, a different object within our program's runtime could call Person dot get full name and retrieve the full name of uh, of an instance of person, but they wouldn't have access to be able to modify, say, the first name or the last name. So when we use class diagrams, we're gonna. It's very rare that we actually have a single class. A lot of times, th there are multiple classes that have relationships with each other. So here we've got some of the most commonly defined relationships. There are additional ones, but for the scope of this series. These are going to be the ones that we mostly focus on. So association would mean that A has a B, meaning like the A class has a private instance variable, or maybe a public variable of type B. Um, it's a little bit different than the next relationship that we're talking about, which is dependency. So dependency is, is defined by this uh, one-way arrow, and it says that A depends upon B to work properly. So this could mean that B has a static method that's called by A. Uh, there are many different ways that this could work, but it means that A cannot operate unless B is operating effectively. The next type of relation is called implementation. So this means that A has a method which, is sa which satisfies the interface that's specified in class B. So we'll learn more about uh, interfaces and their implementations in a little in a little bit here. So the final final relationship that we're going to talk about here is called inheritance. So we already kind of talked about it a little bit. An inheritance is where class A extends class B. So it inherits all of the methods and properties that are defined on uh, class A, and there's no need to rewrite or redefine any of that code. Okay, so now that we've got most of those foundational topics out of the way, let's jump to some of the vocabulary that is a little bit intermediate in terms of object-oriented programming. So we're going to do a little bit of a deep dive into interfaces, virtual classes, and abstract classes. So in general, we want to use these keywords whenever we're trying to define something that's going to be used more than one time. So when you use the keyword in interface, what you're going to be able to do is specify method signatures. So the method names, the input variables, and the return types, but you're not going to be able to specify any uh, variable definitions. So you're going to be able to define, hey, these are the publicly available methods that you can call, but the interface itself will not allow you to define any variables for implementations of it. The next keyword is virtual. So virtual provides you the opportunity to define a default behavior that can be overridden in a child or subclass. 
And the final of our intermediate object-oriented concepts here is the idea of an abstract class. So an abstract class means that you have an incomplete class definition. This means that you can have some of the class's functionality defined, but you're going to leave it up to a child class to say, hey, you must implement one or more of these methods. So interfaces. An interface defines a method prototype without variable definitions. So what does this mean? It means that you can specify what the method signature is, and then you can leave it up to the implementation to define what that, what that actually means. So here, for example, we've got the vehicle interface, and we can see that all vehicles must implement the start engine method. And motorcycle is a specific type of vehicle, uh, but it, it satisfies or it implements the vehicle's interface for start engine. So all, whenever we read the word implements, so in this case, it would be motorcycle implements vehicle. We always kind of think about that as the word does. So a motorcycle does the things that a vehicle does. That's a, a good way to keep this in your mind. Another thing is the concept of a virtual class. So a virtual class allows for optional overriding of methods. So here we've got a virtual wallet class, and we've got this virtual method called getCurrency. It's got a default string value of US dollars or USD. So you could have an extension of that where they change the currency to Canadian dollars or to yen or whatever currency you'd like. But the, the, the virtual class allows you to define a default that can be overridden by any subclass. And finally, we have the abstract class. Now, as I said at the beginning, an abstract class means that the, the class definition is incomplete. So in this particular example, we've got an abstract class called animal, and we can define some private instance variables or public instance variables, or maybe some of the methods we might have defined for the parent animal class, such as, hey, every, every animal has an age. Um, but, but the keyword abstract means that the class definition is incomplete. So we have this method called make sound, and that is using the keyword of abstract. So that means that the subclass or the child class must define what the make sound method does for that particular subclass. So in this particular example, we see that duck extends the abstract class of animal. So duck is a, is a type of animal. It means that it inherits all of the things that are defined at the parent animal class. But then we also have to define what the make sound method means for the duck. In this particular example, you would want to use an abstract class uh, instead of a virtual class because you can't give a default implementation of what a sound is. What's a default animal sound? Something like that doesn't really make sense. Here we say every, every subclass must provide its own sound. So here the duck can say quack. We might have a different subclass of cow that says moo or cat that says meow but the keyword abstract means that you have an incomplete class definition and some of the work is going to need to be defined in implementing the child class okay so next we're going to talk about design patterns so now that we've got a little bit of the object oriented basics down let's let's take a look into what are apex design patterns and why we might be interested in them so apex design patterns are class structures that solve many of the commonly occurring issues in software. So we like to think about it like this. They're not exactly the solution, but they're a collection of classes that have these relations with each other that when implemented can solve a whole host of family of problems. So if algorithms are like the baking instructions, they give you all of the details, say you need to do this, then do this, then take this amount of this ingredient, add it with that one, then you do this, this next thing within the process and voila, you'll have a cake. And then we kind of think about design patterns are more like blueprints where you can see, for example, that this part of the ship is the engine room, but we don't necessarily see exactly all of the engines in there and exactly where, what the door is made out of and all of the implementation details. So we like to think about it like, the algorithms are like baking instructions and design patterns are like blueprints. 
because they communicate a little bit about the a little bit about the solution, but at one higher level of abstraction, they don't have all of the implementation details. So when we have this shared definition of what these design patterns are, they allow us to elevate our vocabulary up one level of abstraction. So that way we can talk about the general parts of the solution and get the entire team on the same page about, yep, this is, this is what we're going to do without necessarily needing to know all of the details. So it allows us to communicate more effectively at one level of abstraction, a little bit higher than that of what we normally do when we're trying to solve an individual problem. So these are going to be the patterns that we'll cover in this series. So uh, stay tuned. We'll go into a, a bit more of a detailed description about each one of these patterns. All of these have really, really cool use cases, and we're excited to share them. So please stay tuned for the next few weeks as we create this content and share it with the Apex Hours family. So if you happen to have any questions about the upcoming content, uh, please reach out to us at Apex Hours or myself at Mitch Spano on Twitter. Uh, like I said, stay tuned. We've got a lot of great content coming that'll show us how we can use these design patterns to decrease the overall cost of ownership of our applications built on Salesforce.com. Thank you very much. Talk to you soon.